In the middle of a small farm town in Illinois sits a car that may end up being the most technological custom hot rod ever made. Rick, he thinks, he thinks they're done once that simple mechanical stuff is The chassis has done, the chassis has been done so long it's trying to rot it out under their ass. But they still have a lot of work to do. So in the Rad Ride shop, there's a permanent fixture who the staff couldn't live without. We call him Chief, and he and Troy became lifelong friends when Troy helped him fix flat tires on a bike he was riding over 30 years ago. Where's Sherlock? Where's Moose? <sighs> That's car show. Car show? He's become a part of everyone's family, and like it or not, he also changed everyone's name. If Chief names you, that's it. That's the law. <laughs> and Adam's uncle. Adam's uncle. A movie star pants. Yep. Chuck. 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 That's Chuck. <laughs> he shakes his head like, no. Rick, he's Johnny Boy. Johnny Boy? So, I don't know how he came up with that. Yeah, Rick's Johnny uh, Boy. Or Keith. Casey, he knows Casey. Huh. Yeah, Lawrence is Lauren. Lauren, okay. Lauren and Warren's Lauren, too, so you got to Oh, Lauren, know, Lauren, yeah, you just got to know. One does this, yeah, and the other goes. Yeah. Customers. <laughs> Maniani. <laughs> George is. George Teak. George Teak. George Teak. Stock car. Um, and Rydell's. Rydell's. Drysdale. Drysdale. <laughs> Oop, I knew there was a point to this. It's One awesome. of the next Rad Rides projects to be finished is a 41 Chevy Fleet Line for Wes Rydell. Or Drysdale as he's been renamed. Wes loves the roof line from this year, but unfortunately, it is only available in a four-door, and he wants it to be a two-door. And just to be fair, I would know nothing about this car <laughs> if Wes didn't tell me every little detail about them. If you said, hey, imagine a 41 Chevy in your mind, I would have no idea. Yeah. I know a little bit about what the 48s look like, uh, the post-war stuff, but I wasn't familiar with this body style. So a lot of the changes that we did to this are directly from Wes. He's studied this stuff for forever. He, he owns a lot of like four-door stuff, but this is really sort of a sporty version for him. Yeah, we talked off yeah. camera. He's an impressive dude. Yeah. I mean, his level of detail and like saying, hey, cut here, move this, yeah. stretch that, to really get this car to look it's, right. It's really unbelievable. A, a, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the concept of this thing and the artistic vision of this thing came directly from Wes, from the customer, which is a little bit out of the norm for us. And so his reason for coming here is not necessarily for that design end of things, but the application of that design. Perfect. Well, yeah. Let's look at like some of the things that people just aren't necessarily, it's not gonna jump out at them because yep. they're not working at this place. But some of the things I see are like this recessed stuff in the frame. Yep. So this is this is just a bulkhead in the frame, but it's got a brake line inside the frame already. So as the frame rail is being constructed, we've already run that brake line in there and put this bulkhead on here. But we did this window so that it's still serviceable. Looks like you're going with a reservoir shock, so you'll be able to really get the suspension moving. Yeah, and that and that's something that's been developed a, a little more recently. Obviously, OE manufacturers have used things like that. Um, you know, live live um, information from the suspension to adjust based on the driving conditions. That's something that's being adapted to aftermarket stuff now, and so that's what this car's going to so, do. Yeah, we'll have that magnetological or whatever that things called with yep. live adapted suspension. Yep. Oh, live wow. adapted suspension on this and you can also control how you want it done at the touch of a button basically. Man, that's sick. <laughs> yep. that's just cool. just a couple other things while we're looking in here. Uh, you can see the radiator tank from this angle. We machine those in-house. Um, structural integrity of it. We can use it as a structural piece. Uh, if we want to build brackets and stuff oh, off man. of it. Like part of the core support yep. instead of just a weak radiator. Yep. And in this case, we have a cross flow radiator for better cooling, but the surface area of that radiator is probably another 40% over stock. Um, and then we made these brackets down here. So it has a removable fitting for the upper water neck up there. If you back that off and take these brackets out, the entire radiator can drop out of the bottom with a fan and everything on it. <laughs> just the radiator alone is so well thought out, guys, that it's just, uh, but you can see in here where all the weld seams are. This was a two-piece hood originally. It was just bolted together down the middle with a piece of trim. So it's got a panel in the middle to tie in the two sides. The whole nose of this thing is new. And then all the flanges on the outside perimeter are new because we're machining a new hood trim piece that is more reminiscent of the 1940 Chevy instead of the 41. It's a little bit different shape. 
this one's gonna be a little bit thinner than the original. Uh, we laid the windshield back almost seven degrees on the back here. What we've done on all the wheels um, on the fenders is we made new wheel lips that match the radius of yeah. the wheel itself. That's so perfect. The wheel's kind of eating the white wall. That is so that's neat. Right. Like a hubcap. Yeah. That's so cool. And these these are designed off of a, I believe an Oldsmobile hubcap and Lawrence machined all this stuff in house here. Um, we don't have the center caps on them right now, but the center cap is designed after a Chevy center cap. And we did a little medallion in the middle that actually matches the horn button. The rockers are all new. It's radiused at the bottom here. Um, before it was square and had a piece of trim at the bottom. I can't tell you how many things we left off, but that should give you an idea of just how well thought out this car is. Now let's get back to work. Here everything gets designed for functionality as well as aesthetics. All you're doing then is you're just covering like the front to a little bit past. Even the air filters for the engine on the 41 requires some serious conversation. Put one of the side panels, at least hold it up there and look and see, like if you pull the filter yeah, out further so you can yeah. actually have room for this, yeah. that it still has room. I got it. Go up in there, Gary. Just see what kind of room you got. The guys looked over available space behind the grill and realized that water could be a problem. They could actually reach the air filters getting into the engine. Nothing a little ingenuity can't fix. What we're doing here is we're starting to lay out and build the deflectors for the air intakes. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep any moisture, if you get caught in a rainstorm or something like that, from getting sucked into the air filter because they are kind of sitting out in the open grill. So what that'll do is that'll cover the front and kind of wrap around to the bottom side of the filter. And then we'll have a return on the bottom of it to deflect any air to keep it from getting attached to the bottom and getting sucked back in for the water so the filter can't drop back up. Um, so what we're starting to do here is just kind of lay it out of aluminum and it'll sit about an eighth inch or so away from the filter so the air could still obviously get sucked in but so there's not a whole heck of a lot of extra room being taken up that doesn't need to be. And then there'll be a flange that actually winds up getting made that'll kind of wrap around and then there'll be a bracket that gets welded to here that'll be drilled and tapped for three mount screws. So that way this will wind up just kind of saddling in like that and covering up the filter to block any airflow from uh, sucking in any excess water. The air filters aren't the only piece of the puzzle being worked on. Adam was busy fitting the hood, getting the hinges right so that it has a perfect gap. Do when I'm replacing these hood bumpers. These are the ones that were in there, and these, these are a different size here. Give us a little more adjustability, and these are a little harder to establish our hood gap. Given the fact that the hood is actually a moving part, it's very difficult, especially one like this on an older car where it has a ton of shape, and the gap isn't on top of the hood, it's actually visible from the side of the car. Using the original style hinges, which is the right choice for this car, will leave them with very little adjustment in the future. So Adam's got to get everything right before it's permanently welded. Looks like he's got the hood fitting like a glove, but Troy's already moved on to the next project. This looks done now. Can you do the doors? No. Got <laughs> lots of details left. This whole time Rick had been quietly working on the back of the Fleetwood, finishing the trunk. And this was by no means an easy job. Rick, this thing's looking different. Yeah, it's a little bit different than the last time you saw it. How much of the original skin basically is left? Because last time we saw it, it was just the inner structure, but you had a lot going on with modifying the inner structure and getting this to work. And the principal reason for all that it was more than just uh, shortening this, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so as far as you know, the other body, body modifications that have been done to it, everything kind of got raised up an inch. So yes, I ended up cutting the original skin off of it all the way around and then had to manipulate the inner structure to now fit that new compartment. So really even from the factory, it didn't fit all that well when we had mocked it up. So probably would have needed to cut it apart anyways, even if we didn't move everything up. Just to raise it to the Rad Rad's standard of quality. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right so we also did uh, radius the bottom of these corners. They had normally been squared off and you know, everything else on this car has, you know, really nice soft curves, so there's really no room 
for jagged edges or anything on this car. So, yeah, it looked pretty incomplete if it just trailed off into nowhere here. So yes, I think that does will look a lot nicer. Does this uh, is it operable? Can we look inside of it? Yeah. So cool. actually, one of the many modifications that have been done to it is putting uh, hidden gas shocks on it. Yeah. So that way it gives it a very neutral feel. So it operates like a modern car. So I mean, you don't have a bunch of stuff in the periphery. Here yes, exactly. Because on. one of the things that I really can't stand as far as like aesthetics is, you know, pulling a deck lid up and then having to mess around with the hood, you know, with a prop. And yeah. then you got to find some spot to stick it and you end up scratching the paint and uh, it just really gets in the way. So this Sorry. way it's nice and clean. Uh, you know, Wes really uses these cars. So he's going to be coming at it from all angles with uh, with folding chairs. So we need to have <laughs> easy access so he can leave the car show uh, quick. That's so. cool that he uses it so well. And I'm, I'm guessing that's part of why other than aesthetically, like you still have the mechanical handle on everything like that. Yes. Is that a West thing? I mean, does he not have any shaved door vehicles or is it just based on each car, like aesthetically, whatever works for the car? Yeah, it's really the theme of this car just in general is still having that old aesthetic, but having all the modern components hidden. That way it doesn't take away from that aesthetic. Sure. sure. So Amazing. everything, we want everything to look as if you didn't change anything, which may seem kind of crazy, but you know, once you really start using it, you know, everything just has a better feel to it. Definitely. And I've noticed this is already epoxied as well. So, I mean, you're done, right? That's pretty much, it's ready for paint. Yes. I noticed you didn't roll the edge over of the deck lid. What, what was the reason for that? You know, no. Normally there's that. And then, I mean, I get it. You'd have to deal with some inconsistency because to get that rolled lip all the way around to look uniform is very difficult. And then here you've just edge welded it, right? Yes. Okay. And that's, that's kind of, I mean, risky, I don't want to overstep, but you run the risk then of changing the entire profile of this thing. Did it yeah. eat up on you and, and <laughs> tore it a little bit? Yeah, or? so that, that's why it uh, takes a little bit of time. Yeah. Uh, you know, we all talk about, you know, making things as perfect as possible. And uh, I can say from experience, I love the way a hand-hemmed edge looks. Yeah. But for a car like this, I mean, I don't care how much time you spend, you're going to have little, you know, you know, highs and lows and things are, it's not going to be a consistent line. So. Uh, for the sake of getting everything edged in perfectly, we just edge weld, and then as you had pointed out, you're putting a lot of heat. You know, there's probably you know 15 feet of welding uh, here, okay. and uh, it is two 20 gauge surfaces uh, put together, so it's already pretty thin. So you got to hammer it as you weld it, kind of manage the shrinkage by stretching it, and uh, yeah, constantly checking it with a flexible straight edge to make sure the panel to panel alignment uh, stays. Yeah, and you nailed it. I mean, the panel to panels, damn near. I mean, so for me, it's perfect. I'm going to say it's perfect because <laughs> you may know where there's an imperfection, but I certainly don't. So in short, once you get it fit perfect, then you got to go back and edge weld, like he said, roughly 15 feet of the surface. That's a brave move, but you know, if it wasn't complicated enough, that uh, that definitely adds a curveball, and you still got it looking beautiful, man. Not to take any attention away from the 41 Fleetwood, but there is another car in the shop that came in for some modification. It's George Poteet's Ford GT. He's the owner of the land speed record setting Blowfish, in case you forgot. As if the one-off color from Ford wasn't enough, Warren stepped in and gave it some really cool matte stripes to kind of match the Blowfish. I think George has got a thing for gold. On an earlier trip, Lawrence had measured and designed the wheels that were reminiscent of the wine glass wheels on the famous 1960s Ford GT40 race cars. I'll go out on a limb and say the wheels on this. That car is amazing and the wheels look like something you'd see on any other Ford car, other than their width and... Which, which was sort of on purpose because we knew we were going to do wheels, so he ordered the... That's the only thing that he didn't order that was fancy. That's the bottom of the line, most base wheel there is. Okay. And we powder coated them and I cut a line in them with a CNC just to decorate them up in the meantime, but okay. um, they are they are as base as they get. So then we worked with them to get a three-dimensional drawing of the wheel and then lay it over the top of this of this uh, line drawing. So basically Lawrence is so busy that he's running these machines 24 hours a day almost literally, so um, there has to be some partnership here sometimes with people that have other machines. So this is the program of the wheel drawing and everything, and then Lawrence can see if it matches what he's done to see if it'll actually work for the car. And then boom, 
That is so cool. But since he's so busy and all of his CNC machines are full of other projects, the work of cutting the wheels out actually fell to Billet Specialties. They have a massive facility with over 50 of these big CNC machines. While we were there, we were able to catch the process of not only the GT40 wheels being finished and assembled, but also some other wheels as well. I got to see the GT wheels in the process of being deburred, is what I'm going to call it. It's actually where they go in by hand and remove the tool path that's left behind by the CNC machine, leaving the wheels with a smooth surface. You don't think I don't want to try my hand at that? I mean, it kind of looks fun, but I know like one little slip and it's over. It comes out of machine perfect. It's got to stay that way all the way through the process. So I'll let the pros stick to it. Maybe I can talk them into one that's, uh, you know, less perfect. The wheels should be arriving any time now. And of course, then I, and well, we get to go for a ride in it. So while I waited, it was back to the 41. On an earlier episode of Rad Rides, we learned the importance of inner fender wells or wheel wells. Troy's told you before on the early cars, he would just skip that part of it. He didn't have the equipment. Yeah. Um, he either had to do it himself or find somebody. And so he'd just skip something like that. No inner fenders, what's, what? what's the point, right? It's to separate the men from the boys type of thing. Cause yeah. okay, he shut the hood, the car still looks cool. And that is really hard to do. And here you can see that no car leaves the shop without him now. One of the cool things about it is, Adam was actually able to incorporate a lot of the similar stamping or design continuity as I call it on this piece as the rest of the car. One of the great parts about the dynamic of the shop is being able to just do a pencil sketch, give Lawrence some dimensions, and then let him figure out how to turn it into a real part. Rick, are you on them tail lights already? Yeah. Man, I should have got here on time this morning. Those were just on a bench yesterday. Yeah, well, you know, Troy, there's no time to sleep around here. <laughs> That's a good point. Gotta make stuff happen. Yeah. That, uh, I just wanted to talk about it because of how complicated that area is. It's kind of like where an airplane wing meets the body. You know, there's so much shape going on there that I think it'd be easy for somebody to just go, yep, but tail lights on. But man, so was there a stock piece like this, this housing? I'm assuming that's a uh, aluminum one Warren or Lawrence whipped out. Yes. One of them guys. What's, oh, what's his face back <laughs> yeah, there? Yeah, that guy that yeah. hides in that back <laughs> yeah. room. Yeah, Lawrence. Yeah, so this is, these are uh, modeled off of a uh, LaSalle tail light. I believe, and we had a uh, original trim piece, uh, but that original trim piece obviously wouldn't fit because it was never designed to run on this car. Mm. So we ended up kind of making a little grid work and trying to figure out where we wanted them placed. And then Lawrence went ahead and mapped out, took some measurements, and then made our own version that would fit the stock sheet metal and uh, make it look like they uh, were always supposed to be there. How does he do that? That, like you said, if you think about it in terms of a grid, like a three-dimensional grid, every little pickup point coming off of here is a different, you know, exists in a different space, and he's doing all that in some virtual 3D world. It blows my mind, you know? Yeah, and it, it blows my mind as well because, you know, as a fabricator, this is one of the most difficult sheet metal shapes to form. Definitely. And it's something we refer to as, as a uh, reverse curve, where you have two compound curves going against each other. So if that wasn't ambiguous enough, yeah, we don't have any 3D scanners or plotters or anything like that. So Lawrence just came back here, put out a couple of tape lines, made some paper patterns and figured out, you know, this helix, the reverse and all that, and then modeled it, yeah, like you said, in a imaginary realm. Yeah, right, <laughs> which he lives in anyway. Yeah, which he lives but, in anyways. But I guess and, it works. Uh, of course, cut it out and first try it fit perfectly. So. That's just ridiculous. Come on. What was on here? What did it look like? Well, it originally had some really tiny horizontal lights that uh, were mounted down low. So this gross. is actually kind of a, a dual function thing that Wes wanted. One is he's all about visibility. Because yeah. like you've heard, I mean, he's got over 30,000 miles on his last car that we built for him. Yeah. You know, he drives these things. So in modern traffic, you know, you want to be visible. And it's already bad enough when you have, you know, a customized car, people aren't paying attention to what they're doing. Yeah. So he wants bright LEDs, wants to be visible, wants them high up. So not only are these very stylistic, you know, once we yes. replace them with LED bulbs and everything, we move them up a little bit higher, uh, gonna have much more visibility going down the road. Yeah, you don't wanna get kissed in the butt in your priceless automobile. <laughs> yeah. There's no fixing that. No. I hate to cut my love affair with a 41 short, but word around town is the wheels came in for the GT. And there they are. 
This is the only modern Ford GT with knockoff wheels that are reminiscent of the ones from the GT40 cars of the 60s that did all the ass kicking over in France. When it comes to the wheels on George's GT, there's a lot more than meets the eye here in terms of complexity and design. I mean, let's look at the design aspect of it first. First thing we have is an actual race car style knockoff wheel, which means that the wheel hub is bolted to the axle. And then you have a center pin here that basically is threaded or is threaded, and then you have a spinner. Now the idea back in the 60s, or even prior to that, when they first came up with a knockoff wheel, is safety and speed. It's safe because you only have one attachment point, so you don't have to worry about it coming loose. And the speed comes in the factor of just being able to knock the spinner off and then being able to remove the wheel when you're changing wheels and tires during a race. Very cool stuff. But to have it actually functional like this is pretty costly, and not to mention the fact that it didn't exist before. I mean, this is the only Ford GT with knockoff wheels on it to date. Now these are the wine glass wheels. These are very reminiscent of what you would have saw on the original Mark 1, 2, 3, and so on Ford GT40s from the 60s. The ones that actually went out there and slugged it out with the likes of Ferrari and whatnot and came to win Le Mans. Now on this car, there was special pay attention paid to everything from the fact that, okay, this is a super complicated high-tech car. So you can't really go messing with the wheel and tire diameter. You don't really want to because Ford's got this car so dialed in, it's ridiculous. But if you want to have that illusion that you've got a thicker tire with a little more sidewall like the older cars had, then you would do what they did here with the design of the wheel lip, and that's to have this shiny black surface that kind of matches the tire and tricks your eye into thinking it's a little bigger in diameter overall. Now let's talk about the fact that this car is such a positive offset. Now they did that for all the advantages it would gain for traction because you got the suspension pushed all the way out to the corners on this car for ultimate traction and control. Well once you do that though you limit yourself on design as far as being able to bend this wheel around and get a lot of shape in it when you're cutting it out. The other things that are limiting factors is if you look, you could barely slip a piece of paper in between the caliper and the back of this wheel. The very precise fit between the two. Just all in all, a lot goes into this. And they're staggered offset obviously because you've got a narrower wheel up front and a big one in the back. But let's go look at the back wheel and see how it differs from the front. These GTs are so impressive when you get to the back of it, but now you can see some of the suspension with the wheel off. And you can see the hub I was talking about. See how it's bolted on conventionally with the five lug studs? and then they actually cut down each stud so that it was flush, give a maximum amount of room for the wheel to mate up to the center point here, which is the hub. Now, this is a carbon ceramic rotor, which is cool, pretty much a full floating hat, just awesome. They got these cars dialed in. But if you take a look at the spinner, you can actually see how this one has a very aggressive spoke shape. So that's the difference between the front and the rear, one of them. And that's basically just because the wheel is so much wider and has a different offset. So they're able to take advantage of the design characteristics and things like that. So the rear wheel is really fun to look at on this car because you actually have a little bit of offset, a little bit of a lip here. And just that width is just so cool to look at. All business, man. Hardly any tread on this tire. Basically a slick. And that's the type of things you don't want to mess with that Ford had set up right. So to blend all of those ingredients together, it's a pretty difficult challenge. Pretty costly one, too. One of the most significant things about owning this car, other than it's so cool and very expensive, is the fact that it came with some pretty rigorous standards for ownership. Most people had to be invited to buy the car, and if you weren't invited to buy it, you actually had to fill out an application, which should involve some boxes needing to be checked, like prior ownership of a previous generation GT. Yes! Hello, burpee! <laughs> Throttle. My God. First impressions about driving the GT is just how much power that little V6 turns out behind the seats. There's no way that's just a twin turbo V6. We'll put it in track mode. Oh my God. <laughs> wing just, <laughs> the wing just went up. Uh, oh, that's man. nasty, isn't it? Dude, I saw it on the screen. That's funny. <laughs> oh, that, I mean, this sumbitch uh, is laying on the ground right now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and the sound is tremendous. V6 has really benefit from the reverberation of titanium. It gives it a very exotic exhaust note. Car. I mean, it's quiet and tight. Yeah, they really, really would, is. They do an extra mile on this one. They do a good job. It's a. Uh, when I had the front end off of it, like I said, it's a fabulous car. It's one car they've never compromised with. They nope. got it right when it was the Heritage one or whatever the one back in like the 05 generation yep. was a great car. Nice too. car. Yep. Yeah. That's the only car that's kept its value or increased. Yeah. From day one. Were you telling me that? Ah, uh, I mean, somebody not told me that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's never lost its value. It's always went up. Definitely true. Pretty awesome. To try and find one used to be a million dollars. Million two, they? million three. Yeah. Yep. So insane. So in essence, we're sitting at a million bucks. Yeah. Here. And it's comfortable. I mean. Oh, it is. Shit, you could go cross country and it's easy. People look at it and this and that, but I mean, honestly, once you're in it and driving it, it's it's yeah. it's comfortable. You talk me into it. Yeah. See. Yeah. We're, ready? Ready? we're stuck in ready? it anyway. Let's get do some it. gas. Let's, let's try uh, to talk somebody into filling it up for us. Yep. This car feels a lot like an open wheel race car, just like an Indy car. And in fact, I think that the body, while beautiful, is only there to cover up the wheels and tires for aerodynamics, because it really does feel akin to an Indy car with inboard suspension and the super long control arms. Gotta get back in time. Back in time. Back in time. The fit and finish of these cars is impeccable. Ford just nailed it. The cars are so smooth on the road, but once it goes into race mode, these things are all business. Oh, watch this trailer tire tip off. And... Yeah, I know, that's what I'm gonna. Fuck, he's like, damn, that's all of that. Like a corn pattern, like a spaceship went by. <laughs> Hey, I'm tell just him gonna... about the time you saw the spaceship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so when you take out Dad's car, it's best to not leave any clues. Now, we can't take off the miles, but it's probably not a bad idea to take off the dirt and brake dust before he picks it up. Right. Only way to keep things nice, to take care of them. Well, all in all, I have to say, not a bad day at the shop. But here's what you can look forward to in our next episodes. That cool but sluggish Brookwood is getting a complete performance makeover and the 41 Fleetwood will be getting cut off the frame to be featured in a photo shoot and head down to the body shop. You won't believe how well it turned out. Plus, construction's gonna continue on the F87, next time on Rad Rats.